Alright, in this video I want to do a little um, background information on enzymes. And um, enzymes are an important topic, and if you watched any of the videos on hemoglobin, then you're probably prepared to start talking about enzymes. So, I just want to go through the basic definitions. Instead of writing them out, I typed out the information I really think is kind of essential to understand about enzymes before you can start talking about how they're inhibited or how they're activated or you know what kind of substrates and how, what the active sites look like etc. You have to kind of understand a few things here. And um, so let's get right into it. It says Virtually all biological reactions are governed by enzymes, which are typically globular proteins. Um, I don't know if I really made the distinction between globular proteins and structural proteins at this point, but basically, you know, that's not all that important. They're basically just globular proteins, and all the biological reactions are governed by these enzymes. Now, the definition that I have for enzymes is that the function of an enzyme is to act as a catalyst, lowering the energy of activation of biological reactions and increasing the rate of the reaction. Now, you know, from general chemistry, you probably remember that all reactions require some sort of energy. You know, nothing's free in this world. Um, energy can, you know, be interconverted between different forms, but it cannot be created or destroyed. So, what we have here is basically saying we're lowering this initial input of energy required to get the, the action to, to get the reaction to go by using an enzyme and, in, and that in turn enhances the rate of the reaction. Now what it says here is like any catalyst enzymes do not alter the equilibrium of a reaction. So that's important because you're not changing the way in which the reaction is going to go <coughs> for a second you're catalyzing it and enzymes another important point that I mean that it may not have written in here but should be made is that enzymes catalyze the reaction equally in both directions so that's what I'm talking about here catalyze the reaction equally in both directions and what this says here is that enzymes increase reaction rates by magnitudes as much as thousands or trillions uh, this makes them much more efficient than typical lab catalysts Enzymes, like other catalysts, are not consumed during the reaction or permanently altered. So that, that's just a, the definition of a catalyst. I mean, you might remember for organ from organic chemistry or general chemistry that when you had an enzyme, that when you had a uh, catalyst, you put a small amount into into the reaction, and it was again regenerated by the end of the reaction. So the same principle uh, um, applies to enzymes. They're regenerated and they're not permanently altered. So the reactant or reactants that an enzyme works on are called substrates. So that's, this is just important terminology so that when you're reading the textbook or when you're thinking about uh, a problem in class or something that you understand what's going on here. So the reactant that or reactants, because sometimes there can be multiple substrates, um, that the enzyme works on is called the substrate. So that's important to kind of point out. The substrate is smaller than the enzyme and the position in which the substrate binds on the enzyme usually through many non-covalent interactions so when I say non-covalent inter interactions I'm talking about hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, ionic interactions, etc. and that's called the active site so the active site is the place that the substrate binds on the enzyme and the, it usually binds through many non-covalent interactions so once the enzyme is bound to the substrate it is known as the enzyme substrate complex so you'll hear this talked about a lot when you start thinking about the different forms of uh, inhibition, enzyme inhibition, because there's competitive inhibition and non-competitive -inhibi non competitive inhibition, and uh, a couple of other ones that, you know, become important and they'll start asking you in class, oh, predict this type of inhibition. And some of them actually operate on the enzyme substrate complex. Others, like competitive inhibitors, actually compete for binding at the active sites. So we'll get more into that in future videos. I don't want to go too far into it here. I just want to basically get the basic terminology down here, which is that the reactant that the enzyme works on is a substrate. The place the substrate binds is the active site. And once the substrate is bound to the enzyme, it's known as an enzyme substrate complex. So that's what I want you to kind of take away from, from this part here. Enzymes are specifically designed to work only on a particular substrate or group of closely related substrates. This is known as enzyme specificity. So you'll hear this a lot um, 
you know, enzyme specificity. Uh, people will talk about it because really e each enzyme catalyzes basically a single reaction, a single biological reaction. Um, you know, while it says closely related substrates, I mean, this is true because that's how you could you could potentially make a, a synthetic inhibitor. So you could make an inhibitor that, that, that mimics the interactions that would be found between the normal substrate and the active site. The, so that it will, you know, interact with the uh, with the um, active site and prevent the binding of the substrate. So you can make a competitive inhibitor or something like that in the lab. Um, anyway, it's just they're very specific. They only bind very specific substrates with specific binding interactions. So hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic effects, it's etc. So I then want to move on to the two theories for enzyme substrate binding because there's two main theories that you're going to hear about. And the first one I want to talk about here is called the lock and key theory. It's one example. In this theory, the active site of the enzyme has a specific shape, like a lock, that only that only a very specific substrate or key can fit into. So that's how that's how it kind of gets its this lock and key method. I mean, both are rigid structures. They're not going to change upon binding. The substrate's not going to change, and the enzyme's not going to change. They're just perfectly designed to fit into each other. The key, the key portion, which we're talking about is the substrate here, is exactly designed to fit this enzyme active site here. I mean, perfect. There's no modification that's going to occur to the enzyme or the substrate. That's why it's called the lock and key theory, and it forms an enzyme substrate complex. So that's the first theory. And the second one here is probably the one that's a little bit more important to understand because the lock and key theory does explain a lot of different enzymes but this one also this one really kind of gets you to understand what's going on with um, enzyme bind uh, substrate binding here so the second theory is known as the induced fit model or induced fit theory in which the shape of the enzyme and the substrate is altered upon binding the alteration increases binding specificity and helps the reaction to proceed in reactions with more than one substrate, the enzyme orients the substrates relative to each other, creating optimal conditions for the reaction. So again, this is the induced fit model. This is an important, another important um, theory for enzyme binding, <coughs> enzyme substrate binding. And in, in this case, the, the, the big difference here is that the shape of the enzyme and the substrate are altered upon binding. Um, this alteration increases binding specificity, but that's what we, we kind of talked about before, that what this, this requires that there's even more interactions between the enzyme and the substrate that are going to occur. They're going to change the shape of both of these things. So it becomes more specific and helps the reaction to proceed. Another important aspect about um, enzymes that's talked about as well is that they sort of orient the molecules or orient the substrates properly so that they can react because a, a lot of reactions require that things are lined up in a specific way obviously because you want to get the, the functional groups or the parts of the molecule that are going to be interacting or reacting with each other rather to be close to each other I mean that's important and that's and that's part of what the enzyme substrate complex does and, and part of what enzymes do so I got a little picture here this is a more probably a more accurate version of the um, way a protein looks here. This is like a ribbon model of it and then these are more accurate you know depictions, three-dimensional depictions of what this would look like um, what this would look like more so than what we normally see. Anyway, regardless of what these pictures look like there there's a specific arrow saying here's the active site and what you'll notice over here is there's a substrate here and it's binding to the active site. But it's not just binding to the active site like a lock and key model. It, it you can see that we have these other arrows showing that the actual enzyme is kind of curving around it or bending around the active site and creating even or bending around the substrate rather and creating even tighter interactions here. So both of these, both the enzyme here and the substrate, are both being altered in this process.
So that's about all I want to talk about for this video. I'll come back and do some videos on, um, you know, enzyme kinetics, which is another popular topic. You'll have to know how to make a few calculations and such with enzymes, and also have to, um, you also have to understand, like I said, inhibition. That's another popular topic. So we'll do both of those next.